Again, let me say it is good to see everyone out with us this morning. We're going to conclude our series of three lessons on seeking biblical authority. Our first lesson was by whose authority. And then we started last week by asking ourselves, how does the Bible authorize? And we're going to continue that similar thought this morning as we're going to go back to a section of lesson one that we just kind of glanced over uh, very quickly and look at the ways that God's Word authorizes. And someone might say, Brother Ray, why should we be concerned about this topic? Well, so when you think about it, they're really asking, why don't you just let folks determine their own authority and let them have their own beliefs? And brother, that's what's going on in our world today. And when you think about it in practical means, this is both unrealistic and unwise. Because we know that the scripture says, as Brother Jonathan read for us that very first passage, the Pharisees and the religious leaders of that day asked Jesus, by whose authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? They were upset with Jesus. Earlier in that same chapter, in Matthew chapter 21, Jesus had gone into the courtyard of the temple and he had uprighted the tables of the money changers. And I believe from study that the reason he did that is because they were making a mockery of the time that they were gathering together. They were taking advantage of others. And so you go on down through there and all the good that he was doing, they questioned him. And so he answers the question by saying, you tell me, the baptism of John, was it from heaven or is it from man? And they could not answer that question because either way, it was going to upset someone. And so Jesus says, and I'm not going to tell you whose authority I do these things by. But you know, you go back to Matthew chapter 8, and you look and those folks came to Jesus because the scripture says he taught as one who had authority. So they were already recognizing the general population, not the religious leaders, but the general population of the Jews. They were already realizing that Jesus was different than the teachers that they had been following. They realized that he taught as one who had authority. And that was upsetting to the religious leaders of that day. And so this morning we want to cover a few things. First, we're going to ask ourselves, how important is this study? How important is it to understand where biblical authority comes from? And then we'll look at the ways that the Bible authorizes. So first of all, let's ask ourselves the question. How important is this question? I hope you will all agree with me that our eternal destiny, our eternal soul, our final resting place hangs in the balance as to how we answer the question. You go back to the passage in Matthew chapter 7 that we've looked at, I think three weeks in a row. The question there, or the statement there says there are two roads. One road is wide and broad, and many there are that go in thereat. And it says that it is a broad way. How easy is it to follow the way that leads to destruction? The second road is that road which is narrow, and it leads to eternal life. 
Now let me throw this out at you as you look at that passage. When you think about the wide and the broad way, those are the individuals who do not respect biblical authority. That is those who think that the Bible does not authorize or it authorizes everything and there's no specific way in which it authorizes. The narrow way which leads to eternal life are those who understand that the Bible authorizes certain things. And we must follow the standard that the Bible sets forth. If you don't believe that, I encourage you to go back to Leviticus chapter 10 and look at verse 1 and verse 2. Now we're going to come back to this verse, but let's ask Nadab and Abihu how important biblical authority is. How important is the authority that comes for God, comes from God? You may remember, and I hope you do, that they were the sons of the high priest. And they were offering worship to God. And we know that they had been commanded to use a certain type of fire. But the Bible says that they used an unauthorized fire. Isn't that interesting? An unauthorized fire. And what happened to them when they offered this unauthorized fire? They were what? They were consumed. Let me ask you a question. Do you think now that they realize the importance of biblical authority to only use that which God has authorized? I suggest the answer is yes. Or how about you go over to 1 Samuel chapter 15. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, you will notice that it is there that Saul is commanded to utterly destroy the Amalekites. What did God authorize Saul to do in battle? God wanted Saul to make the Amalekites extinct. He wanted there to be nothing left of the Amalekites. <coughs> But what does Saul do? Saul decides on his own to spare King Agag. He decides to keep the best of the flocks, to spare some of the women and some of the children. And what was the consequence for following this unauthorized action? Does God not say that I will take the kingdom of Israel away from you? See, brother, you ask, you, you go back and ask Nabab, Nadab and Abihu and King Saul, and they're going to tell you, hey, do what God says, nothing more and nothing less. Follow what he has authorized. And so it seems to me that it would be practical to ask ourselves, what is it that will please God when it comes, number one, to our worship? Number two, how does it, uh, is it important to follow God's word in our everyday life? The answer to the question, how important is this question about authorized and unauthorized, is a matter of life and death. But number two, I want to go back and I want to look at a couple of basic ideas very quickly. I want us to consider two thoughts. And I want you to consider a couple of verses. I'm not going to look at all of these. But I want you to think back to Acts chapter 17. And I hope in verse 11 you'll remember that the scripture says that these were more noble than those in Thessalonica. Why were they more noble? Because they searched the scriptures to see what was true. 
allow me, if you will, to change the word true. And I don't think it changes the meaning of the verse. They searched the scriptures to see what was authorized. They were wanting to do exactly what God wanted them to do. Or maybe we need to turn over to 1 Timothy, or excuse me, let me get back and get my screen back up. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 3, 1 Timothy chapter 3, and let's begin reading in verse 14. Notice what it says. Paul says, these things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly. But if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up in glory. I want you to focus on verse 15. Paul is delayed in going to see Timothy. So he writes this letter. His purpose for writing is so that Timothy might know how to conduct himself in the church. So what Paul is telling us is there is a manner, there is a way that we are to worship or conduct ourselves in the assembly. That is that which is authorized by God. I've got them up there. There's two things you need to remember. Number one, God's word can be understood. The Bible is not difficult to understand. The Bible becomes difficult to understand when man puts his opinion in place of God's truth. But secondly, God's word is to be followed. Brethren, if we're going to please God, we have no choice but to do what he has authorized us to do. And so that brings us to the question, how does the Bible authorize? And I'm going to use three things. There are a whole host of people today, even in our own brotherhood, who say following these three things is antiquated and outdated. Well, I want to tell you that I do not believe that these three ways that God's Word authorizes is outdated. I believe it was done in that way in the first century. I believe you can even take these three thoughts all the way back to the Old Testament and see how that these things were done. So first of all, the Bible authorizes by explicit teaching. And to put it simply, command. We are given commands by God's Word. Go back to the book of Exodus. The book of Exodus chapter 26. Exodus 26. And I'm only going to look at one verse there. But look at verse 30. As the tabernacle is being built, God had given instructions about how to build the tabernacle and what type of cloth and what type of furnishings and all those things. But look at verse 30. And you shall raise up the tabernacle according to its pattern which you were shown on the mountain. Brethren, what is God saying? Here I gave you command to build the tabernacle in a certain way, and that's how you are to raise up the tabernacle. Now jump over to chapter 40 and look at verse 16 down through verse 18. Notice it says, Thus Moses did, according to all that the 
the Lord had commanded him, so he did. And it came to pass in the first month of the second year, on the first day of the month, that the tabernacle was raised up. So Moses raised up the tabernacle, fastened to its socket, fastened its sockets, and set up its boards, and put up its bars, and raised up its pillars. And he spread out the tent over the tabernacle, and put the covering of the tent on top of it, as the Lord, you got this? Commanded Moses. What did Moses do? Everything God said. He followed the authorization of God. And we could go and spend the rest of our time this morning in the Old Testament looking at those who God gave specific commands to and that they did all that he said according to his commands. But let's go to the New Testament. And I've got three things that I want to mention. But first of all, think about Mark 16, 15, and 16. And in that passage, it is dealt with taking the gospel into the whole world. Okay? We're going we're gonna to come back and look at that in just a second. But also consider what we did just a few moments ago as we gathered around the Lord's table. We were commanded to do what? Take of the bread, which represents the body, and we're to take of the blood, or the fruit of the vine, which represents the blood of Jesus. Well, think about it. We're given the command, the specifics. Do this in my memory. We're also told, as Brother Ron read for us in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, that we are to take up a collection. We do it on the first day of the week so that there be no gatherings when I come. And I found that phrase, gatherings till I come, interesting. And when he went over to 2 Corinthians, and he mentioned the part about doing it as we have purposed in our heart. The part about gatherings when I come is don't wait till the last minute to decide what you're going to give. You should know when you come through the front doors every Sunday morning what you are going to put in the collection plate. It's not take your wallet out. Let's see. Well, you know, it's been a pretty busy week and got paid on Friday and I got a little bit left over and I still need, I still need some for the rest of the week so I think this is what I'll give this week. That's not purposing in your heart. That's giving God the leftovers. But let's go and look specifically this morning at Mark 16. What is the specific command that God gives in that passage? He says that we are to go into the world and what? Preach the gospel. The specific there is that we preach the gospel. What is the gospel? Well, we know the gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ who came into the world and lived his life as we live only to go through it with no sin, no spot, no blemish. And then he went to the cross of Calvary and there he died. And after he was dead, he was buried, and on the third day, he arose again. That is the message we need to be preaching. How that Jesus can save us from our sin. Well, Brother Ray, I know that we're required to preach the gospel. But the Bible doesn't tell us how we're to go. That's generic. He leaves it up to us as individuals to determine how we carry the gospel into the world. How did they do it in the first century? They walked from town to town to town. Could we do that today? Yes. 
How do we do it today? Do we do it through media, whether it be broadcast media, television, radio, maybe even print media. Newspaper articles are not as common as they used to be because newspapers are going out of style. But do we have access to the internet? Can we, can we share the gospel through, through, through the internet? Absolutely we can. Can we share the gospel as we're doing this morning with a, with a live stream? And by the way, we're averaging about 20 views a week from individuals. I don't know, what, I, I don't know who all they are. I know some of our shut-in members, they watch. Or when you may be homesick, maybe you watch. But I know that we have others that are watching. <coughs> And by the way, it may say in the bulletin, it may have the number 20. That's the number of views. That's the number of devices that have tuned in. I'll use Freeman and Sheila and Carlton and Cindy. How many of them, how many of those are there? There's four, right? Now that counts as two views, but there may be four people watching. We don't know. We don't know how many. We just know we're sharing the gospel. But brethren, the best way to share the gospel is word of mouth. Word of mouth. The Bible doesn't say how. It just says, go preach the gospel. That's an example. Well, how about, secondly, the Bible also authorizes by implicit teaching. Now, they used to call that necessary inference. You're implying, the Bible implies something that is there. This one is the one where difficulties arise. The problem with implicate is not with the implication. The problem is with our thinking what it says. Okay? Go over to Hebrews. I think that should be chapter 10. It's not chapter 25. Okay, verse 25. What does the passage say? What should we do as we see the day approaching? Should we not encourage one another to be assembled together? and not forsake the assembly as the manner of some is? What does that imply? What, what does Hebrews 10 verse 25 imply when it says that we're not to forsake the assembly? Does that not imply there should be a specific time? Does it not also say that we gather in a specific place? Does it not also imply that we follow a certain order? It, the implication is there. It doesn't say that per se, but it implies that all of those things are needed to complete an assembly. Or maybe we go, and here's the one that everybody likes to look at. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5 in verse 19. I know I had that one. What's Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 19 say? Dealing with worship and music in the assembly. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Or turn over to Colossians chapter 3 and look at verse 16, which is very similar, where it says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. What does that imply? It implies a song. A song. And that is either a song in your memory, 
Or maybe we use an expediency or an expedient thing. Let me ask you a question. How convenient is it for you to have a song book? Oh, someone said, Brother Greg, I don't use a song book anymore. Well, how convenient is it for us to project the songs on the screen? That is an aid. That is something that helps us enhance the command of a song. What about if Brother John or Brother Mike or one of our other song leaders, what if we didn't use a song leader? What would happen? Would it be chaos? Would it be confusing? What if, what if Brother John and Mike and myself and Paul or, or, or someone else that leads singing, what if all of a sudden we all decide to sit out amongst a crowd and Brother John, you're supposed to have the first song. Brother Mike, you're supposed to sing the song before the prayer. And, and would that be disorderly? You see what I'm saying? So there's an expedient, a song that it doesn't say you have to have one. But we do know that the, the inference is there is a song. Or you can go to 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, and you can see about the contribution. To me, that implies you can have a bank account. That implies that you can have a treasury. That implies you have to have some way of taking up the collection. Those things are left to how we interpret that passage. Well, let's go to the third way. The Bible also approved, authorizes by what's called an approved precedent, an example. An example. Does the Bible have examples of when we should do something? You go back to the passage that Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 concerning the Lord's Supper. The phrase in that passage says, as often as you do this. What's the meaning of that phrase? What, what's the example in that phrase? And here's where I get to, to, to go to one of my favorite subjects. Let's let the Bible comment on itself to help us understand the example. We go back to Acts chapter 20 and we look at verse 7 and it says, and upon the first day of the week. I have a question. How many weeks are in a year? How many first days of there, of those 52 and sometimes 53 weeks? How many first days are there? Is there a first day of the week for every week of the year? So by example, the Bible says that we should take the Lord's Supper weekly. It's not hard to understand. Well, how about another thought? How is it that the church is supposed to support mission work? How is the work of missions supported and authorized? I think we learn by example because we can go over to Philippians chapter 4. And we can look at verse 15 and verse 16. Notice it says, Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. Not that I seek to give, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. How are we to support missions? 
Are we supposed to support missions as a congregation? Yes. Can we do it as individuals? Yes. Paul says that the Philippian brethren contributed to his mission work. We have an example of that. And again, brethren, we can look at many, many other examples. So if you, if on a piece of paper, if you write the word C or the letter C E N I, you will see the Bible authorizes by direct command. You will see the Bible authorizes by a specific example. And you will see the Bible authorizes by necessary inference or implication. Well, that brings us to an interesting question. What do we do when the Bible is silent on a matter? Well, I know what most people in the world think, but God doesn't say not to. God doesn't say not to do it. Perhaps a better question is, has God authorized that? You see, because God knew the impracticality of a given, quote, rule book, the Bible is not a rule book that covers every contingency or every situation. So, Brother Ray, what about those things neither specifically commanded nor condemned? Is the silence of the Scriptures inclusive, meaning does it permit something, or is it exclusive, does it prohibit something? Go back to Leviticus chapter 10. And look at verse 1 and verse 2 again. And think about Nadab and Abihu. The Bible authorized them to use what? A certain type of fire. But Brother John, the Bible didn't say I couldn't use this other one. You see, the Bible is silent. Therefore, it is exclusive on that subject. It excludes. When God said, use this type of fire, it excluded all other types of fire. Or you go back and you look at the example of Noah. You remember that Noah was commanded to build an ark. And as we look in Genesis chapter, 20, uh, chapter 6, you begin in verse 9 and you go all the way down through verse 21 and you will read the specifics of what God commanded Noah to do. He told Noah to build this ark 300 cubits, 50 cubits wide, 30 cubits high. One window, one door. Three floors. And make rooms. Well, the Bible doesn't say how many rooms, does it? God left that up to Moses. It was not inclusive in the command. Therefore, he could have put five rooms on one floor, ten rooms on another, and twenty on another. It just said make rooms. But that's not the point I want to make. The point I want to make comes from verse 22 where it says, And Noah did all according to to what God commanded. In other words, Noah left no part out. Again, you go back and you look at Moses. So what this tells me is, in everyday life, in situations where the Bible is silent on a matter, the Bible does not always tell us that we have to have a thou shalt not. I know many of us go to the drugstore after we visit that doctor. And he says, in order for your health condition to improve, you need to take such and such a medicine.
Let's use blood pressure. How many different medications are there for blood pressure? Uh, I don't know. I know there are more than one. So if I go and the doctor writes me a prescription and he says, I want you, this is what you need to take. You need to take Benicar, 40 milligram, one time a day. Well, what if I don't want to take Benicar? And I tell the pharmacist, Chip, I need to take uh, Metoprolol. Is the pharmacist authorized to change what the doctor wrote on the prescription? Well, you all know the answer to that. The answer is no. Then man should not be changing how the Bible authorizes. Because only God can change his commands. Think about back to our two passages about instrumental music. And then I'll close the lesson. What is the command and or the example given in Scripture? Sing. Sing. Speak to one another. Brethren, do you realize thou shalt not add the instrument? It's not a matter of... It's not a matter of opinion. The issue of adding the instrument to worship is a matter of authority and the lack of respect for authority. Because if you want to add instrumental music, mechanical instrumental music, to worship, if you look at the command, the command is for Every one to sing. Therefore, logically coming to a conclusion says, if we want to use the instrument, every one of you would have to play an instrument. Is everybody here talented enough and I'm not questioning your ability. But is everyone here talented enough to learn how to play all these different instruments? What would be the result if we all were playing an instrument? Would it not be chaos? And we know that God is not the author of confusion and or chaos. He has an order in which he wants things done. And that is by following the authorization of the Bible. Go back to the passage Brother Jonathan read. When the Jews came and they asked those two questions, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you that authority? Those are two questions that we ought to be asking ourselves every day. Let's make sure that we are seeking biblical authority for all that we do and all that we believe. This morning, do we have one who under the authority of the Bible says that you must be baptized to receive the forgiveness of your sins? we have one who needs to put Christ on in baptism? Or do we have one who has done that and they've looked away from the Bible and they started following their own ways again and they used the excuse, well, the Bible doesn't say not to. This morning, if you have sin in your life and you need to come home, we can, we can pray with you and pray for you as you are willing to confess and repent about those sins. Won't you do it now? We stand and as we say.